Okay, good afternoon everyone. So this would be our first uh, YouTube live videos uh, for the course of mathematical physics and today we're going to basically go over an uh, interesting yet uh, pretty easy concepts called random variables. Uh, usually denoted as X. As uh, so pretty much all the material that I would like to cover is already on the screen. So you, so you can sort of take a view about that. 好,那今天可能就稍稍跟大家先介绍一下下 呃，都记得呃跟我讲一下这样。那各位当然可以看得到，就是说当我们今天如果切换到呃学习的屏幕上面，那主要当然就是学习的内容。那我就会变小小的。那我下面的这个，哎，这个图的话，呃，是一个设
，所以在讲学习内容的时候，我大多数都还是会用英文讲解。你如果有问题的话，你用英文提问，我就用英文回答你；如果用中文提问，我就用中文回答你。那也不要忘记了。我们的演习课目前也移到线上去了。那我其实事实上有买 Zoom 的云端会议室服务，所以也开放给助教跟各位使用。那各位其实，在上面也可以跟助教有很不错的一个互动。希望大家可以珍惜这样的一个资源。这样，那在这边也跟大家稍稍讲一下，我买的 Zoom， 它其实本身是呃美国总部，就是呃卖到台湾来的一个服务。那它所有的伺服器的话，都是用 AWS 在日本的 Amazon Web Service 啊，所以不会有治安上面的任何的疑虑，请大家放心使用。我们的讨论的话，呃，不会造成你自己本身在网络上乱晃的的危险性。这样，嗯，好，所以这个大概是我们今天上课前，呃，稍稍跟大家说明一下下。接着的话，我们就切换画面。来开始看看我们今天要学习的这样的一个有趣的概念 ，random variable 随机变数到底是什么 ？OK， okay， d o k e y So in addition to the notes and everything, I still encourage you. Don't forget. Okay, we have this very thick and free textbook by Riley. So you can find the chapters,、uh, and then finding their different ways of、uh, explaining and presenting random variables. Okay, so I'm going to provide you my own personal style and my personal understanding. But of course,、uh, if you don't like it, you can still go back and read the textbook. And don't forget. You need to finish the exercise, otherwise you don't really know the material. Okay, okay, okay. And before we start,、uh, I really would like to recommend、uh, another really, really good book. Okay, so this is the book、uh, written by Hacking. It's called Neural Networks and Learning Machines. It has a very beautiful explanation and connections that how statistical mechanics, probability theories, and the modern machine learnings are are connected together. So, I believe you can get free copies of the electronic books in our library as well. Okay, good book. Okay, end of the recommendation. And then that's come back to our first slide. So this is well designed. I hope. So what is random variables in physics? Most of the time, you might just write down a physical quantity. Can you find that, ma? Okay. Later on, I might just type in the、um, the the full information of everything. Oh, I forgot. Sorry. When I am doing the recommendation letter, I should use the large videos.、Uh, thank you for this.、Uh, let's rehearse one more time. So now this is big. I know your complaint right now. This is the book that I recommended. Okay. So the author, the author, is、uh, Haking, but you only need to type in the. Names:、uh, neural networks and learning machines, and it contains many interesting knowledge、uh, about statistical mechanics, information theory, probability theory, and their connection and application to modern machine learning. I truly recommend this book. And of course,、uh, if you are interested in machine learning, you probably want to read this、uh, dreamy book as well. And this dreamy book is free the, on internet. If you just type in "deep learning" the textbook, then you will find this textbook. Okay, so this is written by one of the three giant. So this is the Banjo. Banjo is the second author, and the first author is Goodfellow. Translating into Mandarin, Goodfellow means a how ren. Wow, that's a really good last name. 
feel better? I hope so. Let me get this book back. Okay. So now we are switching back to our learning materials. Great. And so let's talk about the random variable. So the random variable is basically that you have a bunch of events and the collection of this whole is, band, uh, is called a sample space. And with each event, you assign a real number x, okay? And this x is associated with some probability. And thus we write uh, px, denoting the probability that you will detect this particular random number, real number x, okay? And later on, we will also introduce uh, another very useful concept, in particular for continuous uh, random variables. For continuous random variable, we can define a cumulative probability function f of x, and that is defined uh, when the random variables are not taking on specific number, but the less or equal to some upper bound. And so then you sum it up and then you get fx. And by definition here, it should be clear. When you are dealing with just one random variable, if you take the derivative of this capital F, the cumulative probability function, you will get the probability functions. And also, depending on whether the distribution of this x is discrete or continuous, we will have basically two categories of random variables. The first kind is discrete random variable. The second kind is continuous random variable. Excellent. So let's move on. So what I'm going to proceed is that I'm going to introduce several important concepts and skill through realistic uh, random variables so that at least uh, you understand how they work uh, in real life. Here goes the first one. This is almost like the mothers of uh, all random variables. Uh, that's a binary random variable or its official name is called Bernoulli random variable. The sample space is really simple. This is probably the only time that I write down the sample space. Later on, I will just leave it um, and without further explanations. So suppose now, if you just take a coin and throw it on a desk, then there are two possible outcomes. The first is the hat. <gasps> just destroy my nodes. The first one is the hat, and the second one is the tail. Remember, these are events, and you collect them together, and then that's your sample space. And so how do you define your random variable? Well, that depends on what you really want. Suppose now I want to count how many times the head comes up. So then what I will define is that I will define real number associate with each event. And the random number x then takes down the value 1, or zero. So one representing heads up, zero representing tail appealing. Okay. And the probability function, since there's only two outcomes, is also very simple. The probability for the head to appear is P. And for X equals zero, that is one minus P. So simple. You might even wonder, why I need to spend time explaining this. Well, but you will be surprised because even for this very simple manually random variables, uh, it sort of tell us uh, something new, okay? For instance, uh, that's just directly applied to a very interesting phenomenon in nature science, in, in nanoscience. And so at nanoscales, how electron transport is dominated by quantum dynamics. So it's no longer like the current flows uh, in your outlet, and so then the electron just flow out and you can treat it as fluid and everything. No, quantum mechanics matters. What is more important is the following, because uh, electrons are quantized, right? So you got one electron, and 
they try to passing through the barrier and the transmission probability is p. And suppose now you have n quantum tunneling events, okay, during some longer time, let's say t. So on average, on average, yeah, the tunneling rate is n divided by t. And now you want to ask, after the duration t, what is the total charge on the other side? Okay, that means uh, starting from n electron here, they just uh, turn on independently, and what eventually, what are the charges on the other side? And if now you have the idea of random variable, this then become very simple. If electron got transmitted to the other side, it will contribute a charge Q. But since this is not definite, so we cannot just say Q, or we don't want to really write down a very tedious sentence, what we do is that we just denote it by this random variable, Q times X1. So X1 equal to 1 means the uh, first electron just uh, turn on through. And X2 equal to 0 then just means the second electron didn't make it. And so on and so forth. And thus, you can just add all electrons together. And so a very tedious uh, argument then become a rather elegant mathematical expression. That is, the total Q is the summation of all these random variables. And if we want to calculate what is the average Q through the quantum barrier, then it's rather simple. You just take the average of this, and since Q is a constant, pull it out, and since uh, each electrons are basically identical, okay, they're passing by exactly the same potential profile, so the average of X1 is the same as average of X2, n is the same as average of xn. So then, you just got n times charge q and average q1. And the q1 average is just a probability p. That should be simple. So then you got this one. Nice. But what is even more interesting is that you can also calculate the second moment. Okay? We want to explain why this turns out to be really important. Because not only we want to know what is the average current through the barrier, sometimes uh, it is important to know how the current fluctuates, right? It's a, the, knowing the average doesn't really mean that you know how large the current fluctuation is. So we want to calculate Q squared as well. And that becomes uh, much more complicated. Because when you square this whole thing, this got you Q square, that's the easy part. But then you got X1 to Xn square. Wow. Okay. So you got N diagonal terms like X1 square, X2 square, Xn square. They're all the same. So there is a factor N putting out. And we need to calculate this. And there are also cross terms. And this cross term, if you just count them, then it eventually has n minus uh, times n minus 1 terms. Uh, and then giving you the x1 times x2 because these are independent random variables, so just separated. And so their average can be computed uh, individually. And once you do that, this leads to something really, really interesting. This x1 square, this x1 square only take on non zero value. Knowing that x1 is either 1 or 0, right? So the probability for 1 is p. The p times 1 squared is still p. So this x1 squared is still p. Okay? Simple. And x1 and x2, we compute this before. That's p times p. So then you got p squared. So you get a very interesting expression. That is, you get some term which is linear in P, which is a quadratic in P. So you get a linear P term, you get a quadratic P squared term. And from here, you already see the probability give you something non trivial. If you calculate the expectation, the average of Q squared, it is actually not the average Q squared. So this gives us a very 
interesting thing that later on we will explain and define that is the variance of q which is defined as q squared average minus a q average squared okay and since i compute both so q squared it contain these uh, three terms is one term second term and third term i write it out like this and if you subtract the q average square you get this and then these two turn cancels what's truly interesting and amazing is that then you just sort it out this one more time what you found is the following you find the variance of q or the fluctuation of the q is proportional to m reasonable q square already something surprising okay so knowing the current then really give you what are the microscopic charge coming through this it can be many many small cues but then lots of them are passing through or it can be larger cues but rare event passing through but by measuring the fluctuations uh, you see there is a q squared uh, dependence here and in fact in physics uh, we often use this q square to identify what is the charge passing through the potential barrier and finally what is truly interesting is that the current fluctuation is proportional to p this is reasonable right when p is larger the current is larger and you have more charge and the fluctuation is big but you also get this quantum correction so that is one minus p that means uh, wow the variance of reaching the maximum uh, at p equal one half but then afterwards afterwards the variance or the fluctuation of the charge start to decrease in fact for p equal to one there is no fluctuation at all and this is completely quantum because in classical charge transports uh, this does not occur and later on we'll come back to this issue one more time but i just want to point it out here for quantum technology for Bernoulli random variables uh, you add them up you get this interesting fluctuation the uh, situation and you find out the variance is zero for p equal to zero and the variance is uh, also for p equal to one without knowing the technical details uh, one can understand one can understand the consequence uh, by your intuitions okay so what is p equal to zero p equal to zero means that nothing is passing through the barrier that is uh, there's no randomness at all and since there is no randomness at all there is no fluctuation so the variance is zero on the other hand for p equal to one then all electrons is passing through so you have n electron then you got n electrons on the other side so you have n plus one electron then you have all n plus one electron on the other side it is also deterministic and this situation only occurs uh, in quantum mechanics and thus for p equal to one for p equal to one okay you also has this very interesting situation that is there is no fluctuation and thus the variance is zero so try to keep this in mind and this already try to the variance the fluctuation of this uh, try to tell us something different let's go back and ask ourselves about this see this is really cute in the sense it's that uh, the average charge is proportional to v and it is totally reasonable for p is small the q is small for p is one then q is just, uh, passing by right so through the current uh, you sort of see how or what's the signal i try to send out by varying the potentials but on the other hand the fluctuation seems to major something different right it's p times one minus p which means for p equal to zero and p equal to one its value is always zero this brings out a very interesting and secret relation 
So apparently, fluctuation is not associated with the current. It's trying to tell us something more. It's trying to tell us how random, how, how, what's the strength of fluctuations in the charge transport. And so, to some extent, we can say that how much we know about the thermal event. For p equal to 0 or p equal to 1, we know everything for sure. So there is no missing information. And so to some extent, the entropy is minimal. And thus, the variance is 0. On the other hand, when you cook up a barrier where electron has one half probability to passing through, one half probability to be refracted back in this situation, it's the most random case, right? And that's where the variance becomes something really important. So you can see from here, even for a very, very simple Bernoulli random variables, something interesting occurred. So that is the first one that I would like to share with you. So that is uh, this uh, Bernoulli random variables. Okay, so should be easy. Let's move on to the second part. This part uh, is still relatively easy. That is uh, the famous uh, binomial random variables. So what is the binomial random variables? Uh, that is, uh, we cook up a random variable x, and it denotes the number of success in an independent trial. That is, uh, you just take a fair coin and throw at uh, n times, and collecting uh, and asking what is the number that the head appeared. And that is the binomial random variables. And since we're at the infancy to learn the random variables, so I'm being too careful. So whenever you deal with probability theory, locate the random variable, writing its meaning like this out. Later on, determine what's the possible outcomes of these random variables. And so for this, it's discrete. And it range from 0, 1, 2, 3 to n. OK. The next step, then we need to assign a probability for each one of the values. So for instance, uh, if uh, heads appeared uh, x times uh, in the n trials, uh, what is the probability for that? Well, that means that you throwing n coins, right? So x coins uh, appear with its head up. So that's p to the x. And n minus x uh, appears uh, in tail. And so that's 1 minus p to the power n minus x. But remember, because you throw your n times, uh, so there are many, many combinational ways. It can be like head, 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 and then all tails. It can also be tail, 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 tail and then all heads. And it can be any combination between this. And so we of course know that it's basically that from this end trial, you just pick x head event. And so these uh, factorians, uh, the combination of the factorians uh, then give you how many times uh, this uh, x heads up uh, appears uh, in the whole sample space. And so once you got this, you then got this uh, slightly more complicated expression of this whole thing. But I want to emphasize one more time, whenever you deal with random variables, the first one that you need to figure out is what does it exactly mean? Most of the time you get confused. That is because you don't even know how to define your random variables. Okay, once you know that, then everything, half of the thing is solved. The second thing is just the routine. Once you identify the random variables and try to write down all possible outcomes. And then for each outcome, uh, write down the corresponding uh, probabilities. Sometimes it is assigned. It might not have this uh, very beautiful analytic form. Okay, so that should be easy. 
And let me go back. Uh, so, Zhi Yuan is asking. I guess I don't quite get his question. That imagine we have two boxes connected with one path. One is full with particles. Would it be the same result of this statistical system? Hmm, that depends on how you really define it and how they are connected together, right? If these two boxes are contains of quantum particle and the path, what you mean is just some barrier between them, then what I just described, this very famous uh, quantum shock noise, if you just look it up in Google, then you will find all this interesting thing. But if then you're connecting them through some classical transpo uh, channel, then you will get something different. Okay, so. I hope that uh, answered Zi Yuan's uh, questions about the quantum shock noise. Okay, so let's go back to our binomial random variables. Uh, so before we move on, just a very simple, easy check here. You can see it has a very interesting duality. That is, if you change uh, p to minus p, x to m minus x, the probability is the same. That is, if you just uh, reverse uh, the head to be tail, tail to be head, but then counting, instead of counting how many heads up, you just counted how many n minus x tails. And so that, that, that's the same thing. Okay, so your common sense works here. Great. The second thing, of course, uh, usually when I write down the probability distributions, uh, I have already checked this. But if you are the very first person in the whole world to discover this random variable, you would better check whether it is a probability or not. We know probability must be some positive number between 0 and 1. And all probability should add up to 2. No, of course not to 1. Okay, try to remember this. And so normalization important. If we try to sum it up, then we find it is, uh, if you sum up all this uh, through all possible x, you realize uh, that's how the name comes from. That's actually p plus 1 minus p to the power n. If you expand it, and you will get this. But then p plus 1 minus p, the p cancels is 1 to the n, so that's 1. So great, that's 1. Yes, done. So the second one is done. Then let's try to find something uh, technically less challenging, but uh, mentally it's actually quite difficult. And this has very, very strong uh, implications. Uh, for Bernoulli and for binomial, you probably already see the, the close tie between them, right? These are all the binary stochastic process. Uh, which occurs uh, very, very often uh, when you try to perform any calculations uh, in computer science or in data science. Uh. But in nature, uh, exponential decay is everywhere. And so thus, uh, in its discrete form, that's a geometric random variable. So what exactly is a geometric random variable? Suppose now I cook up a random variable and denote it that it is the number of trial until the first success, okay? This is not very easy to understand. That is, I give you a coin, and you just throw it. And so, every time you try it, you might just throw it once, and then you succeed. It means the heads up, okay? So then x equal to 1. You might also then throw this coin for 10 times. Uh, finally, you got the heads up. So what does that mean? That means the first nine times are all tails, right? So the tenth is the head. So here, the first thing is very careful. What is the t possible outcome of x? Well, you know, you can be the unlucky guys in the whole world. 
or in the whole universe, you just keep throwing it and the hat never comes up. So that means that x, now starting from 0, starting from 1, right? At least you need to throw it once. Starting from 1, 2, 3, to basically infinity. And so how do we count? For instance, if I throw it three times, uh, so then the hat's up. What does that mean? That means that I have uh, 3 minus 1, 1 minus p to the square times p. So you throw it three times. It's 1 minus p, 1 minus p, and p. Okay, here comes the following interesting question. It said, why don't we have this uh, combination of factors here? Well, that is the trick, right? That's the definition. That's the definition. That is that x is the number of trial until the first succeed, success. And so what does that mean? That means that all the pattern that you're talking about must be, must be, tail, 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 head, or tail, tail, head, or tail, 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 so there is no factorial factors here at all. It's just like this. And if I part it up, then you find it will fall off exponentially as anticipated. And if you calculate normalization, okay, the first term is p, the second term is p, one term is p, and so you sum it all up this uh, one minus p to the power n is one minus uh, the common ratio, one minus p, and the reciprocal of that. So this just give you 1 over p and that cancel out and it's 1. So great. So everything looks great except one interesting peculiar puzzle. Hmm. It fall off exponentially. What does that mean? Does it really imply that it's most likely to succeed in the first trial? That's weird. Is this random error try to tell us to try our brain luck and not really trying to try anything that we failed the second time? Because uh, the most likely successful rate or a successful probability is the very first try. So if this is universally correct, what's the lesson we learn for our life? That is, we should always try something new and never repeat anything that we fail because uh, the successful ray would just decay exponentially and eventually disappear okay this seems to be this seems to violate the uh, the famous sayings uh, the practice makes perfect isn't it so what's going on here Hmm. So maybe later on, when you look at the video the second time, then you can tell or you can share in the comments uh, what do you think about this. Uh, do you also agree that it's most likely to succeed in the first trial? Or somehow there's some logical bug in trying to comprehend geometric random variables. So, so far so good, okay? Now we got to the major roles that today, that is Poisson random variables. Poisson random variables uh, has many, many different ways to be understood. Okay, so you can understand it in dynamical way, you can understand it in memory way. And here I'm going to take the most commonly seen uh, path, that is, Poisson random variable is just a peculiar larger numbers of the binomial random variables. Okay, so I will write down the random variable first and then see how this uh, come out from binomial uh, random variables. It is a, a discrete random variable. Remember that even though for Poisson random variable or Poisson distributions, uh, Many people draw the continuous, uh, the continuous distribution. It is discrete. It is discrete, please. Many people got confused because they forgot Poisson random variable 
is a discrete random variable. Okay, it's not continuous. So when you are comparing it with some other things like normal distributions, uh, you the better know what you are talking about. Otherwise, you are really comparing orange with apples uh, and they don't really match up that well. Okay? Hmm, I got very interesting feedback uh, from Wu Ya Xian Sheng. Okay, so Wu Ya Xian Sheng give us a, a second interesting idea. That is that uh, we should use cumulative probability distributions instead of probability distributions. Is that right? Hmm, hmm, hmm. So that partially answered the puzzles. But it still didn't really tell us that why the first trials uh, play this significant roles uh, with the largest uh, successful rate. Okay? Okay, so let's move on to the Poisson random variables. So its values range from 0, 1, 2 to infinity. And it is not surprising if you look at the binomials uh, random variable, it's 0 to a capital number n, right? So if now you take n goes to infinity, then this will go from 0, 1, 2 to infinity. And somehow if you then just count that, what is the numbers? Uh, of the head counts and then you will get a really interesting distribution. So, so that is to say, suppose now I'm taking n goes to infinity, I'm taking the probability go to zero. So I'm taking two limits, but then keeping one particular combination is a constant. That is uh, n times p equal lambda is constant. Okay. So basically, you are throwing a coin infinite times, infinite times. But then, the probability that heads goes up is infinitesimally small. And you are holding them such that the product of n times p, lambda, is constant. So it then turns out the binomial distribution will go to this uh, very famous form. So Poisson distribution is a one parameter distribution, okay? There is only one parameter, that is lambda. So you go as lambda to the x. So naively, you might think, aha, so if I multiply lambda the many, many times, would it become larger and larger or would it become smaller and smaller? That's what I see, okay? And divided by x factorians. And this is a true killer. Remember that x factorial when x is large is roughly the function that x to the power x, which is even larger than exponential x. So this is a huge suppression. That means that most of its probability distributions, uh, most of its probability will occur uh, within some finite x, uh, and the long tail is even smaller than exponential. And so if I, I just uh, find a graph on Wikipedia and I plot it out for you, for instance, for lambda equal to 4, then you find a curve like that. And you might find that, oh, this is, seems like a Gaussian distribution, except it's not symmetrical, right? And its average more or less is around 4. And check that, does that right? If lambda is 10, well, it seems to be so, right? So the maximum peaks is around 10. And as lambda become bigger, because there's a lot is away from the boundaries, uh, then these distributions uh, becomes uh, more symmetrical. And one can then ask, is that really Gaussian? Okay, so that's something interesting. But here we're asking something less challenging as a uh, just a very simple thing about Poisson distribution. That is, uh, for lambda equal to 1, and you will see that for x equal to 0 and x equal to 1, the value is the same. And then it starts to decrease. 
So what I want to ask you is that what happens uh, for lambda less than one? How does the Poisson distribution look like? So I will encourage you to really plot this out. And hopefully, unless you know what you are talking about, there have been misconceptions saying that binomial random variables are according to large number, the law of large numbers or the central limit theorem can be described by Gaussian distributions. And thus, a Poisson distribution being a peculiar large n limit can also be described by Gaussian distribution. Is that really true? And we will come back to that. But the short answer is that you might find some hint if you try to answer this much simpler question. That is just try to find out all possible trend of the Poisson random variables. And once you find it out, you probably know the answer immediately. Okay. But how you really try to find the peculiar connections uh, between Poisson random variables and normal random variables, uh, it's, it can be mentally challenging. Okay. So I hope that everything uh, so far so good at this point. It's conditional probability that lead into this puzzle. I think this is a really great question. So how can you just uh, preview into this whole thing? So, oh, interesting. So this is the second video clip that we are going to talk about so for joint probability distribution function. So you can see there is this uh, conditional probability. So we'll talk about that, not in this video, but in next video. Okay? So let's come back to the Poisson random variables. And you know that because now we have the video at hand, so I will go a slightly more freestyle in the sense that I will leave out all loose ends and also uh, more questions for you to digest. To, to chew on, so then you can have more feedback and we can discuss. Okay. So before we moving on, so these are the discrete random variables uh, that I would like to introduce. Bernoulli, that's a binary. Okay, binomial, that's a many binary. And then geometric, it's a series of trial, which then give you exponential. And you can also think about that uh, is something decaying really bear the same tendency or not, okay? And the final one is basically the king of uh, discrete random variable, that's a Poisson's random variable. It's a must-learned uh, random variable, okay? It, it is important because it is so deep. So that uh, there are many, many ways that you can try to look at and then you end up with Poisson distribution. Okay. So right now we're going to move in on to the continuous random variable. So for a continuous random variable, the key is the following. The key is that we, because now this is really just a continuous one and one can use the differential one, but then one can also use a more complete and rigorous definition here. That is, suppose now on the continuous axis, you located a region A. And the region A contains all points uh, between x1 and x2. Okay? And the probability that this random variable will fall into this segment is simple. It's just the probability distribution, sometimes also called probability density function, integrates over the same areas. So in this particular simple case where this A is just a single segment between X1 and X2, and so the area below the PX is just this uh, integral and this is the probabilities uh, that the random variables will fall within this segment A here. So that's the continuous probability distribution function. 
it's just basically replacing the summation before by integration. And because for discrete random variables, for discrete random variables, everything is discrete. So typically, we don't use this more general definition. We don't really set, oh, okay, a set uh, when we define a set, and when a random variable falls into this set, what's the probability of that? Instead, we will assign probability for each event. But for continuous, then this becomes really, really inconvenient, right? Because a single event in a continuous uh, random variable has major zero and thus probability zero. And then some people tend to use this dx and, and things like that. And I also find that relatively confusing. So the general and very straightforward way is just basically draw a non-zero value measures and ask what's the probability associated with that. And this applies uh, to the whole domain or just infinitesimal if you want. So there is no conflict uh, between these. Okay, so let's move on. The first one of this uh, uniform uh, random variables uh, is relatively simple. If you draw it out, it's basically 1 over L between the region 0 and L, and 0 otherwise. Okay, so that means that the only information we know is the x is between 0 and L but then you don't really know where it is. So it's uniformly distributed. And since uh, all the probabilities should integrate to one, sometimes uh, for continuous random number, I will still use uh, sum up to one. So excuse me for the incorrect colloquia. And so here, you know basically this area here must equal to unity so that the probability is conserved. Okay, but for continuous random variables, uh, a new concept becomes uh, rather interesting and useful. That is almost like a switch function, always going from zero to one. Okay, just like a switch, zero to one. That's the cumulative probability function. So instead of a cumulative probability function, it's just a particular way that how you find a probability. How is that? It's basically that you always inquire from minus infinity to some number b. So when you change this b, uh, you found that fb is a monotonic increasing function, right? Because all the probability you add in is positive and thus its value either remains constant or becomes uh, larger and larger. So for this, you can see this fb here because it is a constant upon integration, you get a linear function uh, between 0 and L. And for b larger than L, it flattened to 1. For b less than 0, then there is no probability, so it remains at 0. So you can see this cumulative probability functions always look like some sort of switch functions. Okay, it's starting from 0 and going to 1, and some things are changing from 0 to 1 always. And also, from this definition, it should be straightforward that if you take a partial, if you take a derivative of capital F, then you get the probability density function. Okay, simple. The second one is the exponential random variables. It's also a continuous random variable. It's basically a continuous version of the geometric random variables that we talk about. And so here I'm just plotting out for lambda equal to 0 0.5, 1, 1 1.5, then it corresponding, see this, 1.5 is decaying faster, for 0 is decaying slow. And one important thing that you need to know, because we are now dealing with probability distribution function. So for those with decaying faster, it will start at a larger value. For those uh, which uh, sort of has a much longer tail, then the initial values uh, is smaller. And this should be easy that you just integrate it out and then you will find this. And for cumulative probability function, it's also cute because then by definition is integration minus infinity to the b and px. So how can we do that? 
well, simple. First of all, for b less than zero, that's always zero. So you need b to be positive, to have non-zero value. And once b is larger than zero, you just integrate zero to b and plug it into the probability function. And this is a straightforward integral that you can do and plug it into the lower bound, upper bound, and this is what you got. So from here, you can see for b less than zero is always zero. And for b greater than zero, it then approaching one exponentially with this uh, one minus exponential minus lambda b. And it should also be clear if b go to infinity, this term goes to zero and then they go to one. So this is just another type of switch from zero to one. And technically, technically, sometimes uh, it's much easier to compute the accumulated probability functions. Uh, so instead of struggling with your brain, try to comprehend what the probability density is, most people will just compute the accumulated probability function and then take the brainless uh, derivative to get the probability density function. But once you understand their relations, uh, is straightforward. There's no mysterious thing that why we do this and not doing that. Okay, it's just for convenience. And for some problem or some other people that they might have a different brand, they probably have a probability brand, they, they found out that uh, writing down the probability density functions, uh, it's easier. I, I do know these guys. Okay. Great. Finally, we are coming to the normal random variables. So normal random variables uh, take this form, it's an exponential, and as you can see, it's x minus uh, some number, mu, divided by sigma squared. So that means that if you just uh, plot it x equal to mu, uh, this distribution is symmetrical around the vertical lines. And because it's exponential decay with sigma, that sigma basically measures how fast that this uh, bell shape will decay. So here, let's see. If you see here that mu equals zero, we got uh, three different lines, right? And as you can see, sigma goes to, uh, sigma squared goes to 0.2. 1 and 5. So point 2 is this really sharp one and 1 and 5. So they're basically the same except the half width is becoming larger and larger. And the final one is that it's taking mu equal to minus 2. So you see that this whole curve is moving to x equal to minus 2. Okay, but the shape uh, Oh, it's choosing a different one, so then there is no comparison. So basically, you have four different types. And we can also integrate this probability function to some upper bound, and then you will get a sigmoid function, a switch like this. So that's the cumulative probability function that we are talking about. And the normal distribution, or sometimes called Gaussian distribution, has two parameters. And the first parameter is the mean. That is the basically where the peak is. The second thing is that it has another second parameter that measures how fat that this distribution is. So that's the standard deviations. And the question that I prepare for you is the following. For Poisson's, it's a discrete random variables. And there is only one parameter for the normal distributions. And there's two parameters. Okay. And is that really just two information that we can get in a Gaussian distribution? Is that right? So suppose that I give you a Gaussian distribution. It really just contain two key information. The first one is the average. The second one is the half width around the average. That is the, the strength of the fluctuation. And no more. 
except these two information. There's no more information so in the Gaussian distribution. Is that really right? After all, a function seems to contain lots of uh, information. So is that really right? That for a normal random variable, it only carries uh, two definite information, mu and sigma. So think about that. This is going to be something really, really important because nowadays, uh, when you try to process some of the random noises, you need to understand whether it contains information or there is just nonsense, right? So how do you really pass on information? And either the fluctuation contains some information there, and that is something truly important, okay? So the question I prepared for you is, any extra information in the Gaussian distribution other than mu or sigma is there? Hmm. Great. So saying basically that's the all the random variable that I would like to introduce today. And the following one is relatively straightforward. I, I think most of you probably know this very well. The first one is expectation. The second one is variance. So what is the expectation? The expectation is basically just the average values and we can write it in mathematical form, putting in a random variable, sandwich it with the square bracket and with a capital E standing for expectation. Okay. And so for this degree, it uh, can be ca calculated by calculating the average of x for continuous random variable. This average is carried out by integration but basically that's the same. And the variance is something more interesting. The variance mathematically is written as standing with V. So the V is standing for variance. The variance in Mandarin means B and E. Okay, so variance is B and E shu. And sometimes this is the annoying notation, but since it's everywhere than statistical physics, so I still need to include that. That is the, the fluctuation delta x squared. And this delta x sometimes means the difference, but sometimes it means the fluctuations. I do apologize for that. Most of the time physics, the delta x means x something minus x the other things, the difference. But the delta x here does not exactly mean that. It's just number. It's basically just square root of variance. Okay. Apologize for that. If you are allergic to the delta x, you can also write it as sigma x squared. That would be fine. Mathematicians do that. That is, this is no good. And I'm going to write this as sigma x squared. So good. It's defined as the expectation x squared minus the expectation x squared. So how does this come from? Well, it's really come from that this delta x squared can be viewed as here, this is really the, the differences, the fluctuations. X minus X average. So what does that mean? That means that for the random variable, it has an average. Then instead of looking at the average, you're looking at the deviation from the average. And since it's average, so X minus delta X is sometimes positive, sometimes negative. And if you square that, and you get three terms. The first term just give you x squared average. The second term, because it's constant, pull it out, then you got this. The third term is positive, you got this. And both two things cancel out, then you got this. So that's why we define it this way. But because this is exactly the same as this. So that means if we calculate the fluctuation x minus x average squared, so no matter whether you use larger or smaller, you squared it. So it's always positive definite. And then taking the average of it. And that's a very good measure of how the random variable fluctuates, right? You can imagine that if the random variable do not fluctuate, its average value is its deterministic value. So x minus x average is always zero. So there's no fluctuation. And thus variance, uh, play a very important role uh, in data analysis. 
Without variance and only blindly believe in this EX, most of the time will lead you to some really dangerous conclusion, sometimes even incorrect. Okay, so that's great. And so basically in statistical physics or in probability theories, not only we need to calculate the x average, x squared average, sometimes we need to calculate x to the power and average. And here I'm going to introduce a very simple uh, trick that's called moment generating function and sometimes just called generating function. That is, introduce a function gt that's an expectation value of exponential tx or you can write it this way and so why do we define it this way well you will see if you take a first derivative then with respect to t then it will bring down x right so it bring one down and if you stick in zero and this then become one so then they become x average yes and the trick works indefinitely if you just take second derivatives, know that this is a function of t. Taking the first derivative x, just x like a constant, and taking two derivatives, the exponential is still there, then you got x squared. Again, you sub plug in this value 0 and 0 here, that just means this term is 1. So then, this expression is nothing but x squared. In fact, in general, if you find this generating function and we're taking n derivative, you got x to the n. So this is all great. To cut the long story short, that means once you've got a random variable, find its generator, then you know all moments. Okay? It, you, basically, the coefficient of the generating function is just the moment that you are looking for. Okay? And so that's uh, try to look at how this works. Uh, so this uh, is an example, the binomial distributions. Uh, and according to definition, this is the generating function which is exponential tx. So you take this, okay. So you write it out, that's the probability distribution. And this is the integram that you try to average over. But I highlighted p to the x, exponential t to the x. That means they can combine together and then give you this p, exponential t to the x. And re looking at this summation one more time, this is really just one and the second term in the binomial combination. So you just add them up to the power n. And that's it. So this is the moment generating function. Okay, so let's see how this can help us uh, to find the solution. Well, you just take the first derivative, this bring down n, n minus 1, and this give you p exponential t. And plug in t equal to 0, so this is 1. Plug in t equal to 0, this is p1 minus p. So this whole complicated factor goes to 1. So basically, n and p survive and then you got mp. Easy. And for g double prime zero though, well, okay, it's slightly more complicated, and so that's how we then try to implement this uh, in some other algebraic program to do that for you. But here, let me show you how this works. Again, if you just take this with respect to t one more time, then you bring down a factor n minus one, and inside this whole thing, then you got this, and combined with the previous one, then you got square. And there's also a second term. So the second term is uh, making this, uh, leaving this intact, and then taking a derivative of this. But taking a derivative of that is just the same function, so then you got it back. And plugging in t equal to zero, so the first one, again, this whole complicated expression is one. This whole complicated expression is one. So you end up with this. And this is in fact, if you compare with the previous one, when we try to calculate the quantum shot, that, that's exactly the same thing that we are 
dealing with. So basically, when you're dealing with uh, lots of independent Bernoulli random variables, and the sum is the well, and the outcome that you care is the sum of these Bernoulli random variables, then you got a binomial the distribution as we calculate it here. And so we can also do the same things for normal distributions. For normal distributions, for normal distributions, okay, this generating function again is defined this way, but be slightly more careful, now the average is calculating over the integrals. And you got a quadratic term here, you got a linear term here, and you just recombine them into what we call the complete the, the, the square, okay? Basically, you just redefine this x with the slide shift, and so then you can absorb this linear tx term inside the expression. So I have done the algebra for you. It's amount to this constant shift. So you will leave out this astral term, but know that only this blues uh, highlighted in blue depends on x. That means uh, that's the part you need to calculate the integral. And these are, are just function of t. And so this, upon calculation, of course, give you square root 2 pi times sigma. It cancel with the prefactor, and you end up with this. And finally, the generating function for a normal distribution is an exponential function with a linear term, the coefficient is its mean, and a quadratic term, and its coefficient is its variance. So beautiful. Okay, so let's just do that. If you calculate the g prime zero and g double prime zero, that's a straightforward calculation. Then you got mu and then mu squared plus sigma squared. And of course that this is x squared, right? If you just subtract mu squared, subtract this term, then you got variance. So you see that that's the variance. So nice thing about the normal distribution or the Gaussian distribution is that commonly the two parameters that we use, the mu and the sigma squared. So the mu is just its expectation value and the sigma squared just corresponding to its variance. Okay, so I hope that concluded uh, most of our the technical part today. I hope that this sort of bring up some very interesting um, ideas uh, about the random variables and also when phasing random variables, uh, how you can use the generating function to calculate its uh, nth order moment. Okay, that's now applies us uh, to interesting diffusive dynamics. So you can imagine at t equal to zero, suppose now a particle is sitting at the origin x equal to zero, and it has a microscopic speed v. So that the time step, the time step, because this is the lattice constant a, the time step is just uh, the distance divided by velocity delta t, and then it might hop to the right, it might hop to the left. Okay, so in the absence of any external driver, a particle, of course, uh, has the probability to hop to the right equals uh, to the probability hopping to the left. So then we have pr and p now equal to one half, and they add up to one. You might consider some other diffusion process that it might have a third choice to, to stay in the middle. Well, that turns out it just uh, basically renormalized the parameter that I talked about. So they belong to the same category. Nothing new occurs there. So for simplicity, I wouldn't complicate your brains uh, by explaining the three outcomes of uh, stochastic dynamics. So trust me. Okay, okay. Once you know that, one can ask ourselves, how can we write down the master equation for this stochastic dynamics? Well, think about this. At a later time, t plus delta t, and we ask, 
What is the chance? What is the probability that you observe a particle at x? And since uh, we exclude the, the probability that particle was stayed uh, at the same location, right? So it only comes uh, with two possibility. That is, at time t, the particle is at x minus a, and it decides to hop right, and so then it move from x minus a to x. So that's the first stochastic path. The second stochastic path is that at time t, the particle is at x plus a, and then it takes on a half probability to hop to the left, and then this x plus a then reduce to x. And in one dimension, these are just the two possible ways that you can hop, and that's the master equation. And so now we're taking the continuity limit and then approximate this math equation in the following ways. On the left hand side, okay, you expand it with delta t, then you got this constant, you got this pxt, and then the partial derivative with respect to t. And on the right hand side, it's slightly more complicated, it got two terms. And you expand it to quadratic order. And the reason why you expand it to quadratic order, that is because the linear order, as you can see, one is uh, x minus a, x plus a is just cancel out. So if you expand it to linear order, then you get something nonsensical. And so if you do that to the quadratic order, you find the linear order cancel out. And this, it zeroes order term, this one half p, one half p, and this p also cancel out. So very beautifully, you get a differential equation from the master equation in the continuous limit. And so then, after some algebra, okay, if you add these two together, this gap this, if you do this, and it got this, and then moving the delta t to the other side, and so then, working out the algebra, very simple, you get this uh, diffusion equation like this, okay? Don't, don't pay too much attention to one half, that depends on which version that you are studying, sometimes uh, this one half is uh, soar into the diffusion coefficient, and then the Einstein relation will have a factor of two, it doesn't matter, that's not the key point. The key point I try to tell you is, uh, Starting from the microscopic details, uh, all of this is embedded into one parameter, and this parameter is the famous diffusion coefficient. And this diffusion constant consists of a length square divided by a time square. And also notice the length square and time square are related by a microscopic velocity or microscopic speed, v. Okay, so this is something really, really cute. So once you know the microscopic time step, you know the microscopic length scale, then you can derive the diffusion equation out of uh, the probabilities uh, at different time steps. And the solutions uh, of the above equation, <laughs> I erase my notes again. The solution of the above equation is a Gaussian. And since we already uh, explained the Gaussian before, so you can read out here that uh, its variance is dt, and its mean is zero. And of course, uh, this particular simple form is because I store my particles uh, at x equal to zero. If not, then it would just uh, move to another variables. So, but knowing that that this is not just a polar distribution function, it's a whole new idea. Without the stochastic dynamic, typically we try to find which path, the trajectory of the particle. But once you go to the stochastic dynamics, you don't care about that anymore. You don't know the exact trajectory of a particle, a particle ensemble, right? It can be anything. So you just care about the probability of that. So at each time step, there is a probability distribution of where the particles are can locate. And so here, because the average remains zero all the time, this is already something non-trivial. 
basically it stayed start from the origin and because the right and left follow the parity symmetry so the symmetry is not spontaneously broken by diffusion so it's always there and thus when summing up all possible outcomes the average is zero so when i say the center of mass uh, remains at x equals zero this means uh, that the particle can be to the right or to the left it's just on average it remains right at the origin okay the interesting one is this that is the x squared uh, average okay because the x is zero so x squared average is just the variance uh, it's dt as you can read out from here and if you write it out it's a squared delta t times t this is, is the famous Einstein relation that Einstein's version that how he described the Brownian motion for the first time and in Brownian motion that is indeed correct that is that the particles uh, will just uh, wander around uh, away from the origin although the average displacement is zero because it's isotropic but then it's a uh, fluctuation or you said that its variance is linear proportional to d so you see this very cute exponent here that this is length square and this is a linear t okay so diffusion that means moving without specific directions is less efficient than a ballistic motion in ballistic motions uh, this x and t are linearly proportional to each other and if you take a square root then it's square root t so it does not grow as fast as the linear t okay so i hope that this then can give you a very a, a different perspective about a very important dynamics uh, uh, in physics that is the diffusions and finally finally I have an open question for you to think about. At the very beginning, I said, oh, there is no external drive. But of course, um, you can put in external drive. For instance, uh, you can put in some seductions uh, on the right hand side. So the particles tend to move right. Or you can put in some repellents on the left. So all the particles still tend to move to the right. And so in that case, the PL and PR does not equal to each other and so in this case what happens to the diffusion equation does this whole thing break down or this somehow still holds but then there are additional correction terms emerging from this okay so i won't give you the answer here but i just uh, hope that you will Try to walk through this whole thing and find your cute answer to this. And you will be really, really surprised. In fact, once you know this, you actually know how Ohm's laws emerges. So we often talk about just Ohm's laws, but we didn't really dig into the microscopic dynamics and ask yourself that how does this really come out? And this is your chance that you can actually see when you have an external drive how does the diffusion evolve and how does the probability distribution evolve in time and that's truly inspiring okay so i hope i hope that these are all the material that i try to see and i also see i also showed you how you can apply it to stochastic dynamics but the minimum takeaway is that right now you should feel more comfortable talking about simple space talking about random variable discrete or continuous and try to remember one important thing if you try to identify random variables and you don't know whether it's discrete or continuous then you don't really know your random variable and once you know the random variable is a real number, then you can assign the probability over the probability density function associated with that. And in company, you can also define its integral form or summation form of the cumulative probability function. Okay. 
And so that's pretty much it, all the material that I try to cover in this video. Now, I think the那希望大家其实在学习这些东西的时候希望这些对你其实还蛮有帮助的那在直播的时候我准备东西的内容那真的有任何回馈都非常欢迎跟我讲那所以我们看看说能不能磨合出一个还能够有效的去学习这些有趣东西的方式好吧那我们今天这一段的直播就到这一边结束了天哪并没有比较短啊所以待会三点钟 我不会准时开始，三点钟。嗯，待会呢，我们准时呃开播第二段有关于Central Limit Theorem。那我们就先结束这一段的直播喽，拜拜。<笑>